evening everyone i would like to thank all of you for joining us tonight in this webinar and thank you to my very dear colleague dr anit haya for that kind introduction i'm truly humbled by this experience to be talking in tandem with the father of uh, child and adolescent psychiatry in the philippines dr banaag thank you sir for always giving an inspiring talk and we look forward to your talk tonight Putting this lecture together was a challenge because the topic on adverse childhood experiences is very broad and covers a lot of areas that is very interesting to talk about. Add to that the vast literature av available. But praise God for the wisdom that he gave me to complete, to complete this talk. And I will try to walk you through these adverse experiences and discuss its effects on child development. I would just like to warn you though, that this may be a heartbreaking lecture, but don't worry because I hope it will also encourage you to support and fight for the Filipino child. Let me start by asking you to take this test. This is the ACE test or ACE questionnaire. Just answer with a yes or a no. And remember how many yeses you get, okay? So consider while you were growing up during your first 18 years of life. So go back, go back in your first 18 years, ha? Um, nung bata pa kayo. These are the questions you answer by yes or no. One, did a parent or other adult in the household often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you? or act in a way that made you afraid that you may be physically hurt. So, pinahiya ka. In other words, yes or no. Number two, did a parent or other adult in the household often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or you were injured? Okay, so physically you were abused. Next, did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you? or have you touched their body in a sexual way, or tried to actually have oral, anal, or vaginal sex with you? Yes or no? I hope wala sa inyo naka-experience nito. Hmm? So next, did you often feel that no one in your family loved you, or thought you were important or special, or your family didn't look out for each other? feel close to each other or support each other so na feel mo walang love sa family next did you often feel that you didn't have enough to eat that you had to wear dirty clothes and had no one to protect you or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or to take you to the doctor if you needed it so parang yagit ba next were your parents ever separated or divorced yes or no and then was your mother or stepmother often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her? Or was your mother sometimes or often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard? Or was she ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or a knife? I know somebody who experienced this, but she's okay now. Okay. Number eight, did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? Next, was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt suicide? Okay, and last, did a, did a household member go to prison? Okay, so each affirmative answer is assigned one point. At the end of the questionnaire, the points are totaled for a score out of 10, which is known as the ACE score. So what scores did you get? Probably most of you scored a zero. But did any of you get one? Or probably four? So what is the significance of this test? It reveals that the rougher your childhood, the higher your score is likely to be. And the higher your risk, for later health problems. So, sino sa inyo may mataas na score? Mag-usap tayo later. That brings me to the definition of adverse childhood experiences. 
Initially, it was only defined as potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood from 0 to 17 years old. But over the years, as several studies on the topic are being done, several other definitions are mentioned. It is also defined as a wide range of stressful or traumatic experiences that babies, children, and young people can be exposed to while growing up. It is also defined as intrafamilial events or conditions causing chronic stress responses in the child's immediate environment. And ACEs are experiences that harm children's developing brains so profoundly that the effects show up decades later. So just by definition, the terms adverse, traumatic, stressful, and harmful are already noted and seen. It just reveals how profoundly devastating these experiences can be to our children. Now, ACEs are categorized into three groups, abuse, neglect, and household challenges. Further, abuse is categorized as physical abuse, such as being hit so hard, causing injury, you know? and emotional abuse, such as being insulted. Then there's sexual abuse, for example, being forced into sexual activity. You know? So imagine these things happening in a child. Huh? Okay, so the next category is neglect, further categorized as physical neglect, like not being taken care of when a child is sick, not enough food to eat, or the parents are too drunk or too high on drugs to care for their child. Also, emotional neglect, such as having nobody in the family to be available for support and strength. Also included among the ACEs are aspects of the child's environment that can undermine their sense of safety, stability, and bonding, such as growing up in a household with substance misuse, with mental health problems, with instability due to parental separation, or household members being in jail or prison. While some stress in life is normal and even necessary for development, the type of stress that results when a child experiences ACEs may become toxic when there is strong, frequent, or prolonged activation of the body's stress response systems in the absence of the buffering protection of a supportive adult relationship. The biological response to this toxic stress can be incredibly destructive and last a lifetime. This diagram shows that ACEs can cause injury. It can affect mental health. It can complicate maternal health. There is note of an increased incidence of infectious disease like HIV and other STDs. We have heard on the long-term effect of chronic disease like cancer and diabetes. It can push risky behaviors leading to alcohol and drug abuse and unsafe sex, as well as having a negative impact on opportunities, eventually affecting education, occupation, and income. Researchers have found many of the most common adult life-threatening health conditions being directly related to childhood adversity. A child who has experienced ACEs is more likely to have learning and behavioral issues and is at higher risk for early initiation of sexual activity and adolescent pregnancy. These effects can be magnified through generations if the traumatic experiences are not addressed. But don't get me wrong. There can be other factors that can cause the conditions listed in this diagram. It is just important to know, especially as pediatricians, that adverse experiences that our children face can contribute to these consequences. This adverse childhood experiences or ACE study is one of the largest investigations ever conducted to assess associations between childhood exposure to traumatic stressors and later life health and well-being. The study is a collaboration between the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention 
and Kaiser Permanente's Health Appraisal Clinic in San Diego. The original ACE study was conducted from 1995 to 1997 with two waves of data collection. Over 17,000 health maintenance organization members from South Southern California receiving physical exams completed confidential surveys regarding their childhood experiences and their health status and behaviors during the time of the test. It was similar to the test that, that I asked you to take. The study revealed that ACEs are common across all populations. Almost two thirds of study participants reported at least one ACE and more than one in five reported three or more ACEs. Some populations are more, more vulnerable to experiencing ACEs because of the social and economic conditions in which they live, learn, work, and play. Study findings show a graded dose-response relationship between ACEs and negative health and well-being outcomes. As the number of ACEs increases, so does the risk for negative outcomes. Most studies on ACE pick up from the CDC Kaiser Permanente study. And this is the framework from which the study was conceptualized, the ACE pyramid. It was designed to assess what was considered to be scientific gaps about the origins of risk factors. These gaps are depicted as the arrows linking adverse childhood experiences to risk factors that lead to the health and social consequences higher up the pyramid. Specifically, the study was designed to provide, to provide data that would help the answer if risk factors for disease, dis disability, and early mortality are not randomly distributed, what influences precede the adoption or development of them? The ACE study takes a whole life perspective as indicated by the arrow leading from conception to death. By working within this framework, the ACE study began to progressively uncover how ACE are strongly related to development and prevalence of risk factors for disease and health and social well-being throughout the lifespan. Now, this is the area we want to find out in this talk. How can ACE disrupt brain development and function? And what impacts will it have on the social, emotional, and cognitive well-being of children. Early childhood is a sensitive period in human development during which the brain, especially the circuitry governing emotion, attention, self-control, and stress, is shaped by the interplay of the child's genes and experiences. We will be reviewing this in the subsequent slides. Early adversity and later developmental health are linked through the structural and functional development of specific brain and nervous system circuits. Healthy brain development can be disrupted or impaired by prolonged pathologic stress response with significant and lifelong implications for learning, behavior, health, and adult functioning. Now let's take a quick review of brain development. The human brain follows a protracted course of development beginning approximately two weeks after conception and reaching adult maturity in the third decade of life. Postnatal development is marked by an overproduction of synapses, which occurs largely under genetic control. This overabundance of synapses reflecting an overproduction of dendrites, dendritic spines, and axons during the perinatal period is followed by pruning of the uncommitted synapses. Pruning is influenced by experience, thus allowing brain networks to develop, fine-tune, and become more organized and efficient. It also allows for the brain to optimize in a way that supports its maximum adaptation to the surrounding environment. Myelination is another process and it functionally supports increased neuronal conduction, speed, and communication. By now, you have already heard of several lectures talking about the role of genes and epigenetic modifications. Each person has genes unique to him or her. The expression of genes can be turned off or turned on by certain environmental factors. 
happy experiences, and stressful experiences such as malnutrition can change the expression of genes in brain cells. These experiences produce signals in our own brain cells which respond by producing signaling proteins. These proteins modify the way our genes are expressed, leading to changes in the brain which can be temporary or permanent. The interaction between genes and the environment now causes epigenetic modification that directly affects our development, which brings us to discussion on the sensitive and critical periods of brain development. The issue of timing when we talk about stimulating the brain is very important. Both sensitive and critical periods represent time windows during which experience exerts a particularly strong influence on neural circuit formation. These are the windows of opportunity. Sensitive period is a broad, broad term often used to describe the effects of experience has on the brain during limited periods in development. Critical periods, by contrast, refer to a strict time window during which experiences provides information that is essential for normal development and permanently alters performance. We also talk about experience expectant learning, where the brain expects and is primed for being exposed to the environmental experience, resulting in a rewiring of the brain. And experience-dependent learning, referring to the additional skills developed over the lifespan. So we see the significance of experience in the developing brain. What kaya if these early childhood experiences were traumatic and stressful? What would happen to the brain? Now we look at the effects on the brain. Structurally, structurally there is an overall decrease in brain size. There are reduced brain volumes with alterations observed in the temporal, frontal, parietal, and occipital regions, and in overall cortical gray and white matter volume. And the important areas in the brain greatly affected are the limbic circuitry, the frontal region, and the cerebellum. For the limbic region, given its involvement in emotion processing, stress regulation, learning, and memory, several studies looked into the impact of ACE in this area. Two key structures are emphasized. The amygdala, which is the fear processing center of the brain, and the hippocampus, which is the area that processes emotion, memory, and manages stress. So they also looked at the frontal lobe. So the development of the frontal vision aligns with emergence of complex emotional and cognitive functions, including attention, executive function, and self-regulatory abilities. So they did see a decreased volume in these areas. The orbitofrontal cortex is involved in reinforcement-based decision-making and emotion regulation. The superior frontal gyrus supports working memory. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex also supports working memory helps with cognitive regulation of emotion and planning. Then the anterior cingulate cortex found oh, yeah, in the yeah. medial frontal lobe, oh, yeah, right. supporting mm -hmm. interface and between the, frontal regions and limbic system, systems and is associated with various cognitive processes. So as a result of the shrinkage of these areas, no? so like you see in this image, the left one is a normal brain, the right one is a brain of a child who experienced extreme neglect. You know? So as a result of the shrinkage of these areas, there are consequences on the brain functions that they serve. So in the basal ganglia, and these are multi, multiple nuclei in the forebrain, it supports cognitive control and regulation. It also has an effect in regulation associated with motivation and reward sensitivity, we see alterations in the putamen and striata circuitry. Now, we already uh, mentioned about the cerebellum. They noted reduction in the cerebellar volume and a decreased firmness. 
well, we know that the cerebellum supports higher level learning and cognition as well as modulates behavior through the critical frontal cerebellar connection. Further, there are problem, problems noted in structural connectivity, such as a reduction in tor total corpus callosum volumes, a reduction in white matter organization and myelination. Likewise, like in the um, figure here, there is effect on brain function. They noted functional alterations during cognitive tasks. They also find out that there are functional alterations to social and emotional input. And even during resting states, there are functional alterations noted, as well as impaired functional connectivity. So we see how greatly the brain can be affected. So the next slides will show us the specific effects on the development and behaviors of a child. The good news is the effects are reversible. And this is now where neuroplasticity comes in. This is the question we want to answer. How does it affect child development? Let me count the ways. It is now well established that early adverse experiences increase risk for maladaptive outcomes with sequelae spanning a broad number of developmental domains. In the cognitive realm, children are at increased risk for memory problems, learning difficulties, and cognitive delays, which are likely contributors to disproportionately higher rates of academic difficulties and school adjustment issues. So we see if I can get a census of the orphans that we see in the clinic, majority of them really present with language delays and have learning difficulties. No? Attention and behavior regulatory difficulties are also highly prevalent in children exposed to early adversity likely underpinning risk for ADHD and, associate, and other associated behavioral problems like temper tantrums, aggressive behaviors, oppositional defiant behaviors, and more because of difficulties with self-regulation. So among the children in the streets, you see na sila pa yung magaling makipag-away. No? They have aggressive behaviors. A typical emotional development is also often observed in children reared in adverse contexts. Problems involve difficulties with stress, sensitivity to reward, and emotion and behavioral regulation. There's also difficulties managing their fears. Some may even lead to phobias. And the emotional disturbances mentioned can actually lead to an increased rate of psychiatric disorders such as depression, anxiety, feelings of hopelessness or helplessness leading to suicide. We see an increased rate of post-traumatic stress disorders among these children. Children and adolescents are also reported to have poor decision-making and problems in concentration. And then there are social effects. Children manifest with interpersonal problems and engagement in high-risk antisocial activities are reported even early on in life. So these are the effects in child development and behaviors. The risk factors associated with increased likelihood of experiencing abuse, trauma, and stress in childhood are extremely varied. Among the factors studied are social factors, household factors, family or parental factors, and intergenerational factors. It has been reported that these risk factors are often co-occurring and interlinked, and that it is usually the cumulative effect of a combination of factors rather than a single issue that leads to a child's experience of adversity and stress. Take note of this intergenerational factor. Um, I, I, I'll try to discuss a little more on this later. Now, together with the stated risk factors, the environment which families live in can present additional risk factors that in combination contribute to poor, out, 
poorer outcomes from ACE. These are called adverse community experiences. And in combination with the adverse childhood experiences are termed a pair of ACEs as shown in this image. So pair, hindi lang one but two experiences. No? So it's a pair. Among these adverse community experiences are poverty, violence, discrimination, poor housing quality and affordability, community disruption, lack of opportunity, economic mobility, and social capital. And if you notice, these are very real in our country. Having said that, let us look into the state of our nation. This report, written in 2016, was collaborated by UNICEF Philippines, the Child Protection Network Foundation, University of the Philippines, and the University of Edinburgh. It is an executive summary of a systematic literature review of the drivers of violence affecting children in the Philippines. It included 149 research studies, 89 which are unpublished or gray literature, meaning informally published written material such as research reports and uh, research briefing papers and 59 academic journal articles. And the purpose was to translate quality research into evidence and hopefully turn it into effective and meaningful interventions. They found out that violent discipline is the most frequent form of violence against both boys and girls. And it, it usually begins in the home and impacts violence in other settings and relationships. And it is driven by the violent, uh, by social norms. It makes oh, it's acceptable. So it's all right to be um, inflicting violence at home. And it's also driven by authoritarian parenting, very strict parents, and the parents' level of education. Filipino children are also having an increased vulnerability to sexual abuse. And this is because of the lack of supervision, single-headed households, no single parents, and absent parents. Parenting practices such as the use of coercion, threats, insults, and a frightening tone increases the risk of child maltreatment. In turn, it increases the child's negative behavior, posing an increased risk of experiencing violent discipline and perpetrating aggressive behavior towards others. So it's actually a vicious cycle. No? So if you get to see aggressive children, you might want to look at how discipline is instituted in the home. In all of these conditions, the significant factor that is notable is the use of alcohol, actually the misuse of alcohol, and a parent experiencing childhood or familial sexual violence. So ito na sinasabi ko, it is an intergenerational experience. The parent experienced being uh, treated, maltreated when he was young. So that is why he also uses this as a way of disciplining his children. Now, going back to physical abuse, the report describes a toxic trio of risk factors for physical abuse, which include parental histories of physical abuse. So, yan na naman, sinasabi kong nangyari noong nakaraan, noong, noong kabataan ng, ng, ng parent. And then, financial stress and substance misuse. So, uh, regarding violence against children in school, they reported physical and verbal violence perpetrated by adults as induced by social norms around the use of corporal punishment in school setting and in the family context. Again, it is acceptable because that's why it is used. Corporal punishment can be used. So who among you can relate to this? Sino naka-experience ng napaluhod sa, sa bilao ng mungo when you were in school? No? So the report also report, uh, states sexual harassment both in primary and secondary schools are noted. You know? They also see an increased rate of emotional trauma due to bullying, victimization, and physical fights. There's another report from the WHO Global School-Based Health Survey done also in the Philippines from 2003 to 2004 
they found out that bullying, victimization, and being involved in physical fighting were associated. And that parental supervision was associated with less fighting. So we see the protective effect of parental supervision. These are drivers of violence against children in the community, which they noted. Children are involved in child labor. Children are in conflict with the law. And street-involved children. Dami nating mga street children, especially in urban areas. And we wonder where they are now during this pandemic. They also noted sexual exploitation and trafficking. Plus, the family expectations where children are expected to provide already and to um, raise income for the family, which is driven actually by poverty. Plus, the issue of migration. The list could go on. We have not even talked about problems like the dramatic rise in cases of HIV among our youth the vulnerability of children with disabilities, the increasing rates of teen pregnancy, the emerging threat of pornography. Mind you, our children, even our own children, can be exposed to pornography whether we like it or not. So we have to be very vigilant. Online child sexual abuse and exploitation driven by poverty. Do you know that the Philippines has become a hub for online exploitation, exploitation of children due to our local English proficiency and there is already an existing sex industry including trafficking plus the easy access to the internet. There is also the natural existence of disasters as our country has been known to be affected by typhoons every year. We have experienced major disasters and after that um, child adversity reports on child adversity get uh, increases. No? I even read something like after Yolanda in that area, there was an increased rate of um, sex trafficking no? and child labor. But it is such a blessing that during this time we have not been seeing these disasters. Diba? Hindi tayo naka experience ng major um, uh, typhoons during this time. Sana hindi na. No? And I told you, it was going to be a heartbreaking lecture. Now, hearing all of these abusive experiences our children are facing. But this is a sad and frightening reality. Now, these images reflect the different faces of children in adverse conditions. For my pediatrician colleagues in the group, we may not see it very often in our private clinics. Maybe we can see a number of them in government institutions. But a majority of these affected children are just hidden from society. Because of the culture of silence around issues of abuse against children, plus the fear of reporting. For now, I want you to picture these children in their current stressful environment. So, nakikita nyo na sila, diba? Just the stressful experience we, we talked about. Um, child abuse, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, drugs, uh, violent parenting, dysfunctional family, you know? So, uh, can you imagine these children? Then comes COVID-19 pandemic. Does the situation you pictured in your mind get worse? It could probably be even beyond imagination. So we see effects of COVID-19. We hear uh, effects on the healthcare system, um, economic effects like families having lost income, no? businesses that are closed. Socially, we are isolated from each other and from the whole world. No? Psychologically, there are reports of behavioral problems and increasing mental health concerns both in adults and in children. We also see the impact on families. No? Um, in family relationships, some may have good impacts, but largely there can be strained relationships. No? As uh, driven by job loss, maraming parents na wala ng trabaho, plus the isolation and excessive confinement. Imagine it's been almost seven months since the lockdown and we are still confined to our homes. We cannot yet uh, be free to move around. And then the anxieties over health and finances, financial difficulties, no? And uh, nobody is um, exempted from this parental stress, no? 
Now let's look at further the challenges in children. Good na lang na the viral infection in children, uh, the COVID-19 infection in children, manifests with less severe symptoms and lower mortality rates. Now that's, that's good for us now. But then our children experience change changes in routines. Diba? Hindi na sila nakakapunta sa school. They can't play out anymore. There's a break in continuity of care or learning. So there are a lot of out-of-school youths already. There's a break in continuity of health care, which poses threats to child survival and health. So marami nang hindi nadadala for their regular well baby or OPD checkup. Some kids are not brought for their immunization already. No? So wala nang pumupunta sa mga clinic for um, consultations when they feel something. And uh, we see children missing significant life events. No? Birthdays are not celebrated anymore. Milestones are not appreciated. No? Plus the loss of security and safety. So regarding the security and safety, we look at increased rates of child labor, increased sexual exploitation, teenage pregnancy, and child marriage. We also see an increasing incidence of domestic violence and abuse. We see a large number of children who are orphaned because their parents are affected by the virus. No? So we also see a large number of children inappropriately exposed to digital media, therefore, therefore pushing them into negative um, media use, no? digital media use. So if you see this um, concerns during this COVID-19 pandemic, we see that they are the same drivers for violence against children stated in the UNICEF re report in, tw in 2016. To support the gravity of the situation, recent studies, albeit foreign, report the following in relation to adverse childhood experiences and COVID-19. One study says that greater COVID-19 related stressors and high anxiety and depressive symptoms are associated with higher parental perceived stress, which is associated with higher child abuse potential. Another report says increasing parental stress causing a negative impact on parenting by affecting parents' relationship with their children and increasing the use of harsh parenting. So there's harsh parenting on that. Another report says increased risk factors associated with parental burnout leading to increased likelihood of child abuse and neglect. So abuse and neglect because of parental burnout. Then another study um, reports about job loss during COVID-19 pandemic and saying that it is a significant risk factor for child maltreatment. So these are actually mostly um, parental surveys. So we have yet to see actual studies on uh, what the effects are in the children. As I continued my search for adverse conditions of children during this pandemic, especially for local studies, news of abused women, children sexually abused and exploited. Look at this picture. Um, I saw this in um, news where the mother of a mother of seven had three of her children posing online, dun mismo sa bahay nila, um, for sexual exploitation so that they can have income for the family. No? And we also see increased reports of domestic violence. No? And these are the reports that popped up my screen. So I had to stop my search as I've seen enough to push my positive stress button into a tolerable stress level. So I had to stop before it turns into a toxic stress level. So we see that, that the, the problem of adverse experiences is real. You know, the struggle is real. But there is hope in ACE. So what is the challenge to us and the promise of hope? Research shows that the strongest protective factor linked with resilience to childhood trauma is the reliable presence of a sensitive, nurturing, and responsive adult. So in pediatrics, we always talk about resilience and how to develop resilience in children. And then the presence of a responsive adult. So parenting is key. 
and we will hear more of this in the next talk. Now, there's also the role of positive experiences or what they call counter ACEs, despite the adverse experience. And these activities could actually change the outcome to better health and developmental conditions. So, maka counter niya yung effect. No? Experiences like a child enjoying school, um, the presence of teachers who care, no? Kung hindi ganun ang parent, the teachers are caring. And then when they're given opportunities to have fun, and when there is a predictable home routine, um, children have uh, good friends and neighbors to play with. No? And then further, we see the efforts of government and non-government organizations to serve the children and youth through accessible education and the growing child protection network. And in our own society, we have our Philippine Pediatric Society Council on Community Services and Child Advocacy. So we see activities that uh, support this um, aim. And there's a specific task force on mental health. So my challenge to all of us as towards, as towards of the youth is to consider the children under our care as our ministry, whether as parents, as teachers, as doctors, as healthcare practitioners, as aunties or uncles, whatever role we may have, we can be the voice and we can be the support that our children need. But even see si Jesus, he asked the children, he asked his disciples to let the little children come to me. For the, ki for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So these children are close to Jesus' heart. And this is the hope that I wish to share with you as we faithfully trust in God during this time of pandemic. Thank you. God bless everyone and stay safe.